Let me begin by saying that a funny thing happened on the way to this sermon. It might have been the annual meeting last week that sent me down a different path. Or it might have been that we just sent out 30 invitations to the new members class next Sunday that caused me to take a little detour. Or it might have been Tom's sermon last week about the cognitive errors we all make from time to time that started me thinking about how we see things differently. In any event, when I started to think about this Sunday and the ordination and installation of new church leadership, I decided to take a break from the lectionary readings because, honestly, the gospel lesson about the healing of Simon's mother-in-law wasn't working for me as I was trying to think about what I would say about call and vocation and leadership and gifts and being in community. The brief passage that I read from the book of Numbers about God providing a little help for Moses on that 40-year journey through the wilderness reminded me of how God does indeed provide leadership for the church by calling people to service through the voice of a congregation. It also reminded me of how grateful I am and how grateful you should all be that we don't have 70 elders on session. (laughs) 21 is plenty, believe me. I am grateful for each and every one of you who serve. I thought about using the passage in Acts that we traditionally cite as our deacon ancestry, the part in the sixth chapter where it tells us that in the early Christian community the disciples were increasing in number and the Hellenists were complaining because their widows were being neglected in the daily distribution of food. So the twelve called together the whole community and chose seven additional members under the leadership of Stephen to take care of those tasks. Now one could easily get the wrong idea about this decision by reading in the second verse that the disciples said this, It is not right that we should neglect the word of God in order to wait on tables. Not exactly how our deacons, or probably deacons in any congregation for that matter, would like to think about their call to service. Thankfully, various interpretations reassure us that this phrase isn't to be taken literally, that it can mean referring to serving the word of God. Although for years, when deacon was the only office to which women could be ordained, we spent a lot of time in the kitchen. But I finally turned to Ephesians and that passage about what it means to live in community. The letter to the Ephesians celebrates the life of a church as a unique community established by God through the work of Jesus. It is widely considered as a circular letter that was not written specifically for the church in Ephesus, but it was distributed to a number of churches in Asia Minor. Through the years, there has been debate about whether or not it is written by Paul, was written by Paul, or belongs to one of his followers. Either way, it's familiar language that we read in almost every one of Paul's letters to the churches in Rome and Corinth and Colossae and Philippi, Thessalonica. It talks about life in the community and the gifts of the Spirit, about building up the body of Christ and equipping the saints for the work of ministry, about maintaining the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace, and speaking the truth in love, all things that the church has come to see as part of its mission through the ages. And here's where that little detour through the annual meeting came in. We all believe that we are speaking the truth in love when we take a stand on any controversial issue, as we did last Sunday when we approved the resolution from the Marriage Amendment Task Force. In any controversial issue, it doesn't really much matter which side you're on. We essentially believe that we are all speaking the truth in love. The difficult part about speaking the truth in love, of course, is doing it with all humility and gentleness, with patience, bearing with one another in love, as the passage from Ephesians suggests. And while I think we did that remarkably well last week, I want to remind us that in order for us to maintain the unity of spirit and build up the body of Christ, we still need to continue the conversations with the same humility and gentleness and patience and forbearance with one another that we exhibited at the annual meeting. Later that afternoon, as I thought about what a unique community this is, I was led to reflect on who we are as a community of faith and to ask some questions. Like, what does it mean to be in a community, specifically a faith community? Does it mean that we behave differently? 
does it mean that we see the world through different eyes? Or as Tom asks, do some of our corporative cognitive errors prevent us from seeing things differently? And by that I mean the cognitive errors that we might hold as a congregation. What about what we look for when we join a community? Are we persuaded by friends or values, activities, interests, commitments? Are we part of a community because of commonly held theological or political beliefs? Does that mean we are all alike somehow, or is there something about the diversity of a community that calls to us? And what about our expectations? What can we expect, or what do we expect from our community? Can we expect support and encouragement when the going gets tough? What about challenging our faith and our beliefs? Do we always expect to speak the truth in love and hear the truth spoken in love? Finally, what does the community expect of us? How do we discern the gifts that we bring, the gifts of the Spirit that the Apostle Paul refers to time and again? And what do we do with them? Those are especially good questions on the day that we welcome new leadership and we give them our blessing and our promise of support. If you lifted the lid off any church in a mainline Protestant denomination, you would probably find a lot of similarities. You would probably find a group of people who think about the church institutionally. And by that I mean that you would find folks who have been faithful servants for most of their adult life, giving of their time and their talents on boards and committees, teaching Sunday school and planning mission trips. You would know in a very short time who's in charge of what. You would know what the key decisions are and who makes them. And if you joined that church, you would learn that the questions asked about new members have to do with how they can be involved in the programs of the church. How can we find out what they want to do? You would also find a group of people asking different questions about life and community. These are the people who are less concerned with the boards and the committees and the work groups and the task forces and are more concerned with the informal structures of the church that allow people to be connected on different levels. If they ever even think about boards or committees, they see them simply as another kind of small group, a way to be connected. These people are the ones who are asking the questions about relationship, wanting to help people move from individualism and isolation into a sense of belonging within a caring community that offers them nurture and support. These are the people who think about the church relationally. And most churches, including McAllister Plymouth, are a fascinating mixture of both those institutionally oriented and relationally oriented people, and all of them are interested in equipping the saints for the work of ministry. They just go about it differently. Many of us in the church today are institutionally oriented people. That's the way we grew up. We have seen that the church needs the worker bees or nothing gets done. We've put in our time on committees in seemingly endless meetings in church kitchens at the dishwasher and driving the youth van. We've committed our best efforts to social justice and political reform by marching in protest and registering voters and walking alongside those who walk alone. The problem is that it's hard for us to see through different eyes to hear through different ears the voices of another generation who are saying, that's not what we're looking for in a church. That's not who we are. That's not our identity. It's yours. Are we in if we put in our time and out if we don't? Because if it is, we can't be part of this community. We need a place where we can learn what it means to be in community and through the relationship with the community to be in relationship with God. We are not alone in our realization that the church may be starting to look like a dinosaur. Many mainline Protestant churches are asking the same questions about the future of their ministry. We are looking at a whole generation of people who haven't grown up in a church. People who are looking for radically new ways to be part of a community. They are bringing different gifts and they are expecting to use them in ways that might not be familiar to us. They do a lot of church shopping, and they have no qualms about leaving a church if the church doesn't meet their expectations for community. And that's the bottom line. Where do I belong? What is my community? Who will be there for me? It's not so much where I hang my hat, but where can I hang my heart? Every time there's a transition in a church, people leave. It doesn't really matter what causes the transition or what it involves, people will leave. 
The transition can be a change of pastors, it can be a move into a new building, it can be a different direction in mission or a new Sunday school curriculum or a new music program. People may disagree with either the cause or the transition itself or both. But people leave because they don't feel like they belong to the community anymore. And those who remain often spend quite a bit of time and energy trying to figure out how to bring them back and are disappointed when, they, when their efforts to reconnect those people to the community are unsuccessful. We'd like them to believe that things haven't changed, that we're still the same old someone they adore, as Billy Joel said. But of course that's not true. With every transition comes a change in both the institutional and the relational makeup of the congregation. And for these people, something has shifted perceptibly enough so as to change their sense of belonging. And sometimes the best we can do is continue to make ourselves available for conversation and to always leave the door open. The good news is that it forces us to think about how we're going to be both welcoming and inviting to those who are looking for a new or different faith community. And that's where I took the side trip through the upcoming new members class. It's easy to say that McAllister Plymouth is unique in its theology and worship and ministry, and not everyone will find it to be a good fit. That's true. But I'm not talking about changing the character of McAllister Plymouth to make it more comfortable for more people. No church seeks growth for the sake of growth. What I'm talking about is being more open to those who would seek to be part of a community like ours. But let's be realistic. If they never come in the front door, we'll never have a chance to welcome them and invite them to take a closer look at the amazing and wonderful things that happen here. If they never come in the front door, we'll never have the chance to find out what gifts they might bring that would enrich our life together. And finally, if we don't up our game in terms of our hospitality skills, they're never even going to find the front door, much less come in. Over the next few weeks, once I'm back from a little vacation, I want us to engage in some conversation about hospitality. From the simple acts of hospitality, like coffee hour and the friendship pad, to the more complex and deeper concept of radical hospitality that groups like the Benedictines embrace. It has everything to do with how we see ourselves as a welcoming community. Not just an open and affirming and inclusive community, but a community that is also inviting and welcoming. And not just inviting and welcoming to those who visit and consider membership, but inviting and welcoming to each other. Hospitality is the gift that we give one another. I think there are, actually I know, there is a very real hunger here for a connection at a much different level than we are engaging in at the moment because I've heard it from a variety of different voices in a variety of different ways and I think we need to explore that a bit. My hope is that you will give some serious and prayerful thought to what it means to be community, what you bring to it, what you expect from it, and what it takes to make you feel like you belong. And then let's find some time to talk about it. One thing we know for certain, we all belong at the table. And this morning after we have ordained and installed our new elders and deacons to service, we will come to God's table, remembering why we're here, why we do what we do, and the one who invites us and welcomes us. Thanks be to God. Amen.